My entry into the field of natural medicine pretty unusual from most of my colleagues. So my journey started out way back in 1969 when I graduated from Harvey Mudd College in chemistry. Then I went off to do a doctoral program at Cornell University in New York. And I thought I'd, I'd become a research scientist and love what I was doing. Unfortunately, it was at the height of the Vietnam War. And uh, as I got involved in the doctoral program, I realized I was being involved in the war effort. And at that point, it didn't match up with my philosophy in life. So I decided instead of contributing to the war effort, I'd leave graduate school, come out to Seattle, and I'd work in medical research. So I was working along in medical research, and I really enjoyed doing it. But in the process of working in medical research, and the process of deciding I didn't want to be involved in the doctoral program leading to the war effort, I started reading about nutrition and such, and decided to become a vegetarian. Now, I'd like to say there's some great scientific reason for it, um, or even this great, I might say, spiritual philosophical reason for it, but I just, I just became curious about it, so I became vegetarian. And as I became vegetarian, kind of my worldview started changing. So off I went to do medical research, and I was thinking, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a PhD in medical research instead. And then the woman who married my roommate from college one day mentioned to me that she had been cured of her juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I thought that was interesting because I was actually working at the Department of Rheumatology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. And I was working with MDs and PhDs trying to find a cure for arthritis. And um, rheumatoid arthritis was an incurable disease. And yet, my friend had been cured of her arthritis. What's going on here? So being scientifically oriented, I said, well, so what happened? She said, well, I went to a naturopathic doctor. And my response was, what's that? Because at that point, I knew there were you know, MDs and PhDs. I would occasionally seen a, a sign for a chiropractor, but I had no idea what that meant. So, um, so I said, I went to the naturopathic doctor and said, so what'd you do for my friend? And he said, well, I taught her how to eat properly and I detoxified her liver. So what's her liver have to do with her hands and her knees being swollen? So that was quite interesting. Now having become a vegetarian, uh, I asked one of the medical doctors I was working with, what do these changes in my body mean from becoming vegetarian? And his response was, there are errors in your observation because diet does not affect you. Now remember, this is half a century ago, and that was kind of standard medical belief at, at that point. So being objective, I asked the naturopathic doctor exactly the same questions. So he said, here he is, he's, he's cured my friend. And so I said, you know, I see some change in my body from becoming a vegetarian. What does it mean? So he went to his bookshelf, pulled Guyton's Medical Physiology textbook off his bookshelf. Now at that point, that was like one of these standard textbooks for conventional medicine. And then showed me physiologically how becoming a vegetarian was changing my body. I thought, well, that's interesting. This naturopathic doctor seems to know physiology better than the MDs. So that was a big surprise. <clears throat> so anyway, so I then said, well, can I spend a few days seeing you see patients? And I would see, quote, miracle case after miracle case of people who conventional medicine had failed, come see this next path doctor with these vitamins and herbs and physical medicine and such, he'd restore their health. It was just stunning. So anyway, now, now I'm curious, but go back to doing medical research. Then there's another occurrence. So I was helping a MD do a postdoc. She was doing a research study on a new drug for rheumatoid arthritis. So the, uh, the model at that time was ducks. So the, the, the reason a duck model, because you can see the duck bill, they're, they're really easy to see what's going on with their inflamed feet. So um, we, uh, the ducks came in, we went over to the vivarium to check out the ducks, make sure the right ducks, et cetera, because these are the ducks that were genetically bred to get rheumatoid arthritis. So they always get rheumatoid arthritis. So very simple study. Half got placebo, half got the drug. Did the ducks get the drugs? Do better. So um, we went to the vivarian, checked, yep, all the right drug, uh, ducks were there. But this MD was kind of a kind-hearted woman. When you look at the ducks, these poor ducks were in these tiny little cages. I mean, just barely big enough for them, and they looked miserable. Now you might say, wait, how do you know if a duck's miserable? Okay, anybody who has pets will tell you, if your pet's unhappy, <laughs> they make it known. So um, she got together with, with her husband. They got an empty uh, lab and they built a little duck run for the ducks. They put um, 
some plywood up, put some sand in there. They put in some uh, uh, little plastic swimming pools so they could swim around. They brought some fresh fruits and vegetables. And now the ducks are running around quacking and they're already happy. So what happens? The ducks didn't get the arthritis. So at her going away party, uh, or say almost like a wake, people are saying, oh, we're so sorry, your study didn't work out and your postdoc was a waste, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm looking out at all of them and saying, wait a minute, don't you get it? It wasn't that we couldn't test the drugs. It was by giving them a healthier lifestyle, they didn't get the disease, so they didn't need the drugs. Right there in front of you is the real cure for any disease is not to get it. So I looked at that and said, well, that's interesting. Here we have a situation where it's this naturopath using these natural therapies and people get better, you have this own direct experience with these animals, you feed them properly, they don't get a disease they were bred for. You know, I think I'll be a naturopathic doctor instead of a researcher. And that kind of changed the world. So I decided to become an naturopathic doctor, so I started looking into it and discovered that there was only one naturopathic college left in all of North America. Conventional medicine had been very successful at suppressing this body of knowledge. So um, if you look back in the 1950s, the profession was actually developing very, very quickly, naturopathic medicine. Licensed in over 20 states, uh, they're developing more science-based education, making a lot of progress. And then over a period of just seven years, the MDs went after the nature pass and they destroyed the profession. And they went from 22 states licensed to, when I enrolled way back in 1971, only six states still licensed naturopathic doctors and we were a felony in two states. So it was very, very grim. And the reason that conventional medicine was able to discredit natural medicine is kind of two, in two big reasons. Number one is this was an era where it looks like drugs are going to be working. I mean, here you had antibiotics kill, again, after infection, works very well. Cortisone, uh, getting inflammation down very quickly. We've just gone through world wars that have now developed um, surgical procedures, very, very effective. So look at conventional medicine was doing really well. So we went to state legislatures and said, well, you don't need this natural medicine, these herbs and vitamins and things. We got these drugs, we got the surgery. We're really effective. You don't need the nature pass. And in addition, they engage their political bodies to basically destroy everything about the profession. So here I am, way back in the 1970s, uh, 71. Only one school left in all North America, and uh, it was so hard for the profession to even exist that virtually all my teachers were teaching for free. One of my teachers would basically come from Kamloops, Canada, every couple of months to teach us his body of knowledge, because in many situations, there are very limited, limited number of people left who, who understand these key aspects of natural medicine, and they were dying off. It was just, it was just disappearing. So I went to school, and the good news is that I got to spend time with some really good clinicians. The bad news is that they weren't teachers, they weren't ac academics. The educational program is not very good. Nonetheless, I went through the four-year program, graduated in 1975, and they made a pledge to myself that I believe this medicine had a future, but it could not become an important part of the healthcare system until it came to modern standards of education and research, textbooks, things like this. So for example, when I was in school, the most modern textbook in naturopath medicine was written in the year I was born. I mean, that's how bad it got. So um, I got myself elected to the board of trustees of the school I went to, which was National College of Naturopath Medicine. And I made a pledge to the student body that I would spend two years trying to bring NCNM up to modern standards of education. And if I couldn't do it, I'd go off and start my own school. I was a really young, young man at that point, and I had no idea what I was saying. I just, I was just, I was making my commitment rather than thinking I would ever have to start a school. But it turns out, after two years of trying to get the school to move forward, I realized that the profession was in a bunker mentality. Because conventional medicine had been so effective at destroying all the other schools, de-licensing the profession, they didn't want to stick their head above the foxhole because they would get chopped off. And I realized, well, yes, that would mean survival, but the, the value that this medicine brought to helping alleviate human suffering 
wasn't going wasn't going to happen that way. So I decided um, to start my own school. Got together with my friends, Drs. Les Griffith and Bill Mitchell, and uh, invited a good friend of mine, uh, Sheila Quinn, to start um, a new school. And I mentioned it to my receptionist, who mentioned it to her mother, and her mother said, what a great idea, and she sent me a check for $200. And with $200, I started what was then named the John Bastier College of Naturopathic Medicine. Now, one of the ironies of that kind donation was that I had always concerned myself a failure with her because I was only able to clear up 75% of her rheumatoid arthritis. I couldn't get her enough improved that she didn't need the drugs anymore. Her perspective was, well, I've been suffering from the severe disease. I'm so much better. I can dramatically decrease my use of drugs, which means I'm not getting the side effects of the drugs. I think you're a great doctor. We need more like you. It's always interesting. The doctor says, well, I want to get it perfect. And the patient says, Wow, I'm so much better, I'm so grateful. So with that $200 um, in 1978, uh, we started the John Bastier College in Naturopathic Medicine. Now, when I started Bastier, I had a very clear vision of science-based natural medicine. My belief was that if this body of knowledge had validity, it should be subjectable to uh, research and it should be reproducible we need to write modern textbooks, we need to do a credit education, we need to do it right. So when I started Best Year, that's what I did. I first recru recruited PhDs to teach the basic sciences. So anatomy, physiology, pathology, biochemistry, it doesn't belong to any particular field, it's a body of knowledge. So I brought in PhDs to teach that to the students. Then for the diagnostic courses, I invite a lot of MDs in, because MDs are very good at diagnosing disease. They're not very good at treating most diseases. I mean, MDs are great at teaching acute, treat, treat acute disease and injuries, things like that. I mean, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Conventional medicine does a lot of wonderful things. But in terms of health promotion and re reducing and removing the underlying cause of disease, it's not, it's not a very good model. The drug model is not very good for that. So anyway, so then I got the MDs doing diagnosis and I got the naturopath teaching how to cure people naturally, all the therapies, how you work with the body rather than try to take over the body. Or if you look for, if you look at the effect of most drugs these days, all they do is turn off symptoms. They don't deal with the online cause why people are sick. So I started Bastier and I did it right. And by doing it right, Bastier became the first accredited University of Natural Medicine anywhere in the world. Because this medicine had never been accredited by any government agency anywhere that I'm aware of, at least in the English speaking world. And by doing that properly, we did you know, good quality education, we engaged in good quality research, we started getting articles published. And then my, one of my dearest friends and a great a graduate of Bastier, Dr. Michael Murray, and I wrote the textbook of natural medicine. In the early days of Bastier, as you might expect, we were struggling quite a lot because not only was there a lack of resources, but there are no, not, no modern textbooks either. So we're kind of stuck with using conventional textbooks, medicine textbooks for diagnosis and physiology, and things like that. But for therapeutics, we're dependent upon what the doctors could teach and there's no, there's no like good textbook. So in 1983, one of our very early students, uh, Michael Murray, came to me and said, Dr. Pizzorno, I would like to write a modern textbook of naturopathic medicine. Would you do that with me? And I said, God, what a great idea. I'd love to do that. Because like Mike, I've been looking at a lot of research and finding research support for this. Now it had to be compiled. So we got together in 1983 and spent two years and created the first edition of the textbook of natural medicine. And in this textbook, we compiled the research that was available um, in, in, in PubMed. It's not like we were making this up. The research was there, nobody was using it. So we compiled the first edition of the textbook it was about well, about a thousand pages. We had about 7,500 references, and we showed that a lot of the basic concepts and interventions of natural medicine had very good research support. And what was exciting about the research support, it was showing it was reversing the disease, not simply decreasing the symptoms of the disease. It was fundamental. So we created the textbook. Now, in retrospect, some 35 years later, I realized how pivotal that particular work was in providing the kind of scientific foundation for this revolution in medicine we're seeing today. I can't tell you how many 
MDs have come to me and said, you know, I got into medicine because I wanted to heal people, but after I've been doing it for a while, I realized all I was doing is giving people drugs, and while the drugs will make them more comfortable in the short term, they will continue to get sicker and sicker and get, need more and more drugs and then eventually fail. And, and that wasn't why I got into medicine. Then I read your textbook. And I read your textbook and, re, re, and it reminded me of why I got into medicine. And that from there, they went to integrated medicine, functional medicine, and things of this nature. So now, that textbook has sold, has sold 100,000 copies. Over half were bought by MDs. It's been translated into six languages all over the world. So it's, it, it proved to be a, a very important um, time for helping establish the credibility for thinking fundamentally different about medicine. Starting last year was very, very hard. Remember, this is way back in the late 70s, and natural medicine was not well received. Again, only six states licensed us, and we're a felony in two states. <clears throat> so it was really hard. So when I started the school, of course, the first thing I did is I went to the uh, foundations to ask them for donations to get the school started. Well, any foundation that would give money to anything around healthcare would, of course, have an MD on their committee making that decision. And so, of course, I, I won't be so hard as to say they laughed at us, but basically that's what happened. They said, no, and why even bother to waste our time? So it was pretty clear that the only way to start the school was from an entrepreneurial perspective. Nonetheless, decided to give it a try. So I was able to um, attract people who believe in what we were doing and were willing to work for below standard wages because they, they believe in what we were doing. Got the school started, and I early realized we had to become accredited because until our accredited, education was accredited, no one would take us seriously. So I went to the credit agency, the local credit agency, and they basically said, no, uh, we don't accredit schools of your nature. And being a little naive at that time, I just accepted their statement. Well, another school started a year after us down in, uh, uh, in Oregon, and they hired an attorney to look into their, the criteria for accreditation and realized that actually according to their own laws and bylaws, we were eligible for accreditation. So they applied for accreditation. Now, as it turns out, that school, from my perspective um, and their perspective, did not have very high educational standards. And so they went through the accreditation process and were not approved. But when I saw that they had done it, I thought to myself, well, we should do it as well, because we had been doing it very, very well. As I said, using conventional textbooks, using conventionally trained PhDs and MDs as part of the educational system, we looked really good. So we applied for accreditation, and indeed, we went through the process and it, and it was challenging, lots of political challenges, but went through the process and became the first accredited University of Natural Medicine ever anywhere in the, in, in, in the world. But again, it was hard because there was no money. But once we got accreditation, once we started getting student loans, and with the accreditation, we're now eligible for research grants from the federal government. We started, we started now bringing some resources so we could grow the school, not just in terms of size, which of course was important, but in terms of the quality education we could offer. We could bring in more people, we can bring in more textbooks, we can do research, we can get better facilities, better laboratories, uh, and we're able to take off. If you look at the history of Western medicine, going back to Greco-Roman days, there's been basically two schools of thought. One school of thought is the what's called the Sclepian school of thought, and the other is the hygienic or Gaia school of thought. So the one school of thought was the body makes mistakes, the body is a victim of the environment, we're all the doctors to take control and fix things. The other school of thought, the hygiene school of thought, is the body has tremendous ability to heal, and the role of the doctors understand what's blocking the body from healing and support the natural healing processes. If you look at the history of medicine, the pendulum swung back and forth, back and forth. And in reality, right now is we have a system which has been dominated for over almost 100 years now by that conventional doctor take control, use drugs, the body makes mistakes, and take control, be, be authoritarian there. Um, whereas the other school of thought has been politically uh, and socially and financially suppressed. The best healthcare system is not one or the other. I hate the term alternative medicine. That means one or the other. No, it's not true. You need both. 
The conventional medicine works great in areas like you have an inf infection overwhelming the body, got involved in an accident, your body's been damaged, uh, some disease has progressed so far, now that you, you, the body can't fix it anymore, you've got to take care of it. Works great in those situations. But it doesn't work well, it doesn't work very effectively at all. As a matter of fact, it probably is a detriment to the other side of the equation, which is making the body stronger. Helping people understand why they're sick and how to become healthy. Most disease today is due to factors that are under the control of people who are sick and who need the doctors to help them understand that. Less than 20% of disease is due to genetics. All the rest, 80%, is diet, lifestyle, environment, uh, all the things that people choose. So the best doctor, from my perspective, is one who, first off, understands where the patient fits. Do you need higher intervention, or do you need nurturing and health restoration? And then with that nurturing and health restoration, understand what is blocking the body from functioning properly? Do they have high levels of, for example, arsenic in the water supply? Most people don't realize that arsenic accounts for about one quarter of all cancers. Um, I, 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 I can give you example after example where the cause is understood, the cause is controllable, we can fix it, dramatically prevent most disease, and when people have the disease, we can reverse them. I've been involved in medicine now for literally over half a century. First as a medical researcher, then as a student in naturopathic medicine, then as a practitioner in naturopathic medicine, then as a founder of Bastyr University. Um, I, over this period of time, I've written seven books for consumers, six textbooks for doctors. I've seen uh, several thousand patients. I've also been involved in corporate wellness programs where almost 20,000 people have utilized tools I've created to help people understand why they're sick and how to become healthy. So I think I've got some pretty good insights about why people are sick. So I think about a patient, and I don't care where they are in the spectrum, whether it's they want to be, they're healthy now, want to avoid getting disease in the future, or they have a disease now, they want to reverse it, whatever the case may be. And I look at kind of three, three um, realms, you know, like, like kind of like a, a Venn diagram. In this realm here, we have a person's genetics. In this realm here, we have a person's nutritional status. In this realm here, we have their t exposure to environmental metals and toxins. And right in the middle is where people get disease, where they have a combination of genetic susceptibility and adequate nutrients for the body to function properly and being exposed to environmental toxins so now their body is breaking down and they're getting disease. So let's talk more about what that means. Talk about genetics first. So when we look at genetics, while it is true that somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of disease is due to genetics, the rest of it, 80, 85 percent, is due to not genetics, but other factors. And even those where you have disease due to genetics, if you understand a person's biochemistry and how to use nutrition, you can often mitigate those as well. I would assert that less than 10% of disease is um, unmodifiable by living it healthily. So the vast majority of the reason people are sick is under the control. So let's look at that. Let's look at first nutrition. If you look at people's nutritional status, Using the conventional standards, over 50% of people are deficient in one or more nutrient. Now that's what the general standards say. I did a corporate wellness program, uh, or uh, designed it and implemented it in Canada, where I looked at 4,500 oil field workers, mainly young men, but we also have some office workers as well. And um, I tested them uh, for the nutritional status, uh, metabolic status, uh, toxin load. I did equivalent about $1,500 of lab tests on 4,500 people. So I got a chance to look at a lot of data on a lot of people. And I found that out of that 4,500 people, less than 1% were not deficient in one or more nutrients. So nutritional deficiencies were rampant. Then I looked at toxic load and most of them had toxicity. So it's very, very clear that a lot of people are in a situation where not only do they have a genetic susceptibility, but almost everybody's deficient in at least one nutrient, most people are deficient in many nutrients, and now we have an environment that's very, very toxic. So you add them all up together, and the epidemic of chronic disease we're seeing throughout the world is totally explainable. I like using diabetes as, as a perfect example. So when I was in naturopathic medical school half a century ago, diabetes affected less than 1% of the population. 
Now, 10% of the population has diabetes, and we're projecting that one third of people in the North America are gonna get diabetes in their lifetime. What happened? Do the genetics change? No. Now, if you're nutritionally oriented, you might say, well, people consume more sugar. Sugar is the cause. Well, it turns out, well, I'm not gonna say sugar, eating a lot of sugar is good for you. The excess sugar consumption started like 50 years before the diabetes epidemic started. So if sugar was causing diabetes, there ought to be a correlation. There's no correlation. Then you might say, well, how about obesity? Yep, people who are obese have dramatically more diabetes than people who are not obese. Matter of fact, you look at an obese woman in the top like 5% of obesity, they have like a 60 fold, 60 times higher risk of diabetes. Okay, but if you look at a diabetic, if you look at an obese person and look at their toxic load, You'll find that diabetes, people who are obese in the bottom 20% of environmental toxic load have no increased risk for diabetes. You hear what I just said? Everybody knows people who are obese get diabetes. But if they're not, if, they're, if their fat is not full of toxins, they don't get the diabetes. So what's going on? So there's a researcher in uh, South Korea by the name of uh, Ducky Lee, who's done some great, great work here. But starting about 20 years ago, she started showing the correlation between the body load of environmental toxins, particularly things like pesticides and herbicides and things, direct correlation between the body load of these toxins and incidence of diabetes. So you start to look at this, and indeed, what these toxins do is they bind to insulin receptor sites. And so, because they bind to insulin receptor sites, our poor pancreas has to overproduce insulin to get sugar into cells to keep us alive. Great example of how remarkably adaptive our bodies are. Even a harsh situation, Lots of toxins, we still have to some way to stay alive, but we pay a price. Because now you're over, over working the pancreas, and after overworking the pancreas for 20 or 30 years, of course, it burns out now, because you worked it too hard, and now you've got diabetes. So people don't suddenly get diabetes, they got to work at it for a long period of time. So we look at something like diabetes as a great example of a chronic disease that's increased dramatically. And by the way, most people don't realize that one out of every five healthcare dollars is spent treating people with diabetes. It's our most expensive disease. Okay, so it's a great model. So when we look at diabetes, is diabetes due to a deficiency in metformin? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm being a little facetious here, but metformin doesn't deal with the cause why people are having diabetes. So um, the, the promise and the beauty of natural medicine is that we look at the causes of diabetes. So for example, look at diabetes. I wrote a book. My latest consumer book is called The Toxin Solution. So I got a note from somebody who said, oh, you know, I've had diabetes for 15 years. I won your detoxification program. And after nine weeks, by simply detoxifying, my diabetes went away. So as we look at why people are sick, you've got to deal with the causes. And that's the problem with our current healthcare system. So much of the interventions being used only treat the symptoms of the disease. They don't treat the causes. If you look at the top 10, most commonly prescribed drugs. Go on the internet, do this yourself. Look at the drugs. Nine of the top 10 only deal with the symptoms of the disease. And I'll include in symptoms also signs of the disease like lab tests. So for example, you get the statin drugs to decrease cholesterol levels. Well, except for people who have already had a heart attack or a stroke, statin drugs don't do much good for these people. Their cholesterol levels go down, but in terms of disease, disease incidence, I wrote an editorial on this about three years ago where I showed you're eight times more likely to get an adverse reaction to a statin drug than a benefit from a statin drug if you use them for primary prevention. Far more effective is living healthfully, getting good nutrition, avoiding toxins. One of the areas I'm most excited about in medicine right now is this modern technology we have available it helps us to much more deeply understand why people are sick and how to become healthy. So for example, now for not very much money, we can test a person's genetics. And by testing the genetics, we much better understand what the susceptibilities are. For example, arsenic. Arsenic, uh, according to the latest research that I've seen, uh, looks like it caused about one quarter of all the major cancers. Lung cancer, prostate cancer, uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. Biggest factor is arsenic. So, we now have a standard where we say, okay, this much of arsenic in the water supply is okay. Well, actually, it's okay or not okay 
dependent upon a person's genetics. So arsenic is an example of a toxin we were exposed to as we evolved as a species. So we're very good at getting rid of arsenic. Half-life in the body is two to four days. But the problem is 10% of the public water supplies in the United States that have reported their arsenic levels have levels known to induce disease in humans. But here's where genetics comes in, into play. So the, the way the body gets rid of arsenic is through this two-step two process. We methylate it to something called monomethyl arsenic which is actually eight times more toxic than arsenic. Then we do a second, second methylation to dimethyl arsenic that then gets rid of the arsenic very quickly and it's 400 times less toxic than regular arsenic. Okay, so great, get rid of it very quickly. Some people, because of genetics, get stuck in the first phase of the monomethyl arsenic. So is that very common? Well, it turns out 21% of the population has the genetics where they get stuck in the second phase. So rather than 10 micrograms of arsenic per liter of water being safe for the average population, then it's only about five. Even worse though, there are people who have a genetic poly polymorphism where they have great trouble getting rid of arsenic. So not only can they not get rid of it from, fate, from the mon monomethyl to dimethyl, but they have trouble getting rid of it at all. It's only 1% of the population, but they have way greater disease susceptibility. So the beauty of our, of our world right now is we now understand arsenic does cause disease. We now understand people with certain genetic susceptibilities have way more susceptibility to damage from arsenic. Now we can understand who's got to avoid arsenic carefully, how do you facilitate the body's own mechanisms for getting rid of the arsenic, and we can dramatically increase people's health. I've now looked at, um, let me think, I've looked at 17 cancers, 21 chronic diseases, and about a little bit over 30 environmental toxins, metals and chemicals. Looking at how much each of these toxins causes each of these diseases and how genetics affects it. And I can tell you, we understand genetics, nutritional status, toxic exposure. You can predict what diseases people have and you can determine the best way to reverse that disease and get them back to health. When looking at the research that shows very clearly that most of the chronic disease epidemic throughout the world is due to environmental toxins, the next question is, what do you do about it? Okay, so number one, of course, is avoid toxins as much as possible. That means adopting a lifestyle that promotes health rather than is, you might say, the most convenient. Uh, when I write about naturopathic medicine, I talk about it <clears throat> as being more than simply a healing art, it's a way of living and being in the world. So you have to learn how to live low toxins. I mean, eat organically grown foods and low toxin health and beauty aids and take off your shoes when you enter the house, all these things you can do. The second thing we want to do is to promote the body's own natural processes for getting rid of toxins. One of the things that I found that was really surprising when I was looking at how the body gets rid of mercury, I found the study showing the body gets rid of about one shirt, one one percent of the body load of mercury every day into the gut. I thought, well, that's great. Then I looked more deeply and realized then the body reabsorbs 99% of the mercury it just dumped into the gut. Why would our smart bodies waste all that metabolic energy to get rid of mercury and then just reabsorb it? It's because we sabotage the, sabotage the normal detox mechanism. As we evolved as a species, we consumed 150, I'm sorry, 100 to 150 grams of fiber a day. Now the average person consumes only 15 to 20 grams of fiber a day. So if you want to support the body's own natural healing processes, a very simple thing to do is eat more whole foods high in fiber and even take supplemental dietary fiber so you help the body's own natural processes to get rid of the toxins. We can also facilitate the body's ability to get rid of toxins by using nutrients like N-acetylcysteine. If that causes increased production of glutathione and glutathione plays a huge role in body detoxification. And the final process is to then look at what are the things we're doing that make our body less able to detoxify metabolically and get it working properly. So in my book, The Toxin Solution, I talk about how do you clear up your gut? How do you get your liver function properly? These are the ways we get rid of most of the toxins, get them working properly. And when we do that, as we get rid of toxins, our health improves.